Hi, friends. I'm Annie F. Downs. Let's read the Gospels. The Gospels are the first four books of the New Testament in the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These are the stories of Jesus Christ's life on earth, the friendships, the parables, the sacrifices, the meals, and the miracles. Each month we read all four books. So go ahead and subscribe today if you haven't. Join us as we read all the Gospels together this month. Here's how this works. I'll read three chapters to you. You can listen or read along in your own Bible, and then I'll pray, and that's it. Today we finish the book of Luke, a perfect Saturday to read the last three chapters, to read about this exact weekend in history. And then tomorrow on Easter Sunday, we start the book of John. Invite your friends and your family to join us tomorrow on Easter to hear the book of John. It'll take a week, just like Luke has, but what a beautiful book to begin on Easter Sunday. But today, today is April 8th, day eight, and I will be reading Luke chapters 22 through 24. And this month I'm reading from the message. Luke 22, the feast of unleavened bread, also called Passover, drew near. The high priest and religion scholars were looking for a way to do away with Jesus, but fearful of the people, they were also looking for a way to cover their tracks. That's when Satan entered Judas, the one called Iscariot. He was one of the twelve. Leaving the others, he conferred with the high priest and the temple guards about how he might betray Jesus to them. They couldn't believe their good luck and agreed to pay him well. He gave them his word and started looking for a way to betray Jesus, but out of sight of the crowd. The day of unleavened bread came, the day the Passover lamb was butchered. Jesus sent Peter and John off, saying, Go prepare the Passover for us so we can eat it together. They said, where do you want us to do this? He said, keep your eyes open as you enter the city. A man carrying a water jug will meet you. Follow him home. Then speak with the owner of the house. The teacher wants to know, where's the guest room where I can eat the Passover meal with my disciples? He will show you a spacious second story room, swept and ready. Prepare the meal there. They left, found everything just as he told them and prepared the Passover meal. When it was time, he sat down, all the apostles with him, and said, You've no idea how much I've looked forward to eating this Passover meal with you before I enter my time of suffering. It's the last one I'll eat until we all eat it together in the kingdom of God. Taking the cup, he blessed it and then said, Take this and pass it among you. As for me, I'll not drink wine again until the kingdom of God arrives. Taking bread, he blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you eat it in my memory. He did the same with the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant written in my blood, blood poured out for you. Do you realize that the hand of the one who is betraying me is at this moment on this table? It's true that the Son of Man is going down a path already marked out, no surprises there. But for the one who turns him in, turns traitor to the Son of Man, this is doomsday. They immediately became suspicious of each other and began quizzing one another, wondering who might be about to do this. Within minutes, they were bickering over who of them would end up the greatest. But Jesus intervened. Kings like to throw their weight around, and people in authority like to give themselves fancy titles. It's not going to be that way with you. Let the senior among you become like the junior. Let the leader act the part of the servant. Who would you rather be? The one who eats the dinner or the one who serves the dinner? You'd rather eat and be served, right? But I've taken my place among you as the one who serves. And you've stuck with me through thick and thin. Now I confer on you the royal authority my father conferred on me, so you can eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and be strengthened as you take up responsibilities among the congregations of God's people. Simon, stay on your toes. Satan has tried his best to separate all of you from me like chaff from wheat. Simon, I've prayed for you in particular that you not give in or give out. When you have come through the time of testing, turn to your companions and give them a fresh start. Peter said, Master, I'm ready for anything with you. I'd go to jail for you. I'd die for you. Jesus said, I'm sorry to have to tell you this, Peter, but before the rooster crows, you will have three times denied that you know me. Then Jesus said, When I sent you out and told you to travel light, to take only the bare necessities, did you get along all right? Certainly, they said, we got along just fine. He said, this is different. Get ready for trouble. Look to what you'll need. There are difficult times ahead. Pawn your coat and get a sword. What was written in scripture, he was lumped in with the criminals, gets its final meaning in me. Everything written about me is now coming to a conclusion. They said, look, master, two swords. 
but he said, enough of that, no more sword talk. Leaving there, he went, as he so often did, to Mount Olives. The disciples followed him. When they arrived at the place, he said, pray that you don't give in to temptation. He pulled away from them about a stone's throw, knelt down and prayed, Father, remove this cup from me, but please, not what I want. What do you want? At once, an angel from heaven was at his side, strengthening him. He prayed on all the harder. Sweat wrung from him like drops of blood poured off his face. He got up from prayer, went back to the disciples and found them asleep, drugged by grief. He said, what business do you have sleeping? Get up, pray so you won't give in to temptation. No sooner were the words out of his mouth than a crowd showed up. Judas, the one from the 12, in the lead. He came right up to Jesus to kiss him. Jesus said, Judas, you would betray the Son of Man with a kiss. When those with him saw what was happening, they said, Master, shall we fight? One of them took a swing at the chief priest's servant and cut off his right ear. Jesus said, let them be, even in this. Then, touching the servant's ear, he healed him. Jesus spoke to those who had come, high priests, temple police, religion leaders. What is this, jumping me with swords and clubs, as if I were a dangerous criminal? Day after day, I've been with you in the temple, and you've not so much as lifted a hand against me. But do it your way. It's a dark night, a dark hour. Arresting Jesus, they marched him off and took him into the house of the chief priest. Peter followed, but at a safe distance. In the middle of the courtyard, some people had started a fire and were sitting around it, trying to keep warm. One of the serving maids sitting at the fire noticed him, then took a second look and said, This man was with him. He denied it. Woman, I don't even know him. A short time later, someone else noticed him and said, You're one of them. But Peter denied it. Man, I am not. About an hour later, someone else spoke up, really adamant. He's got to have been with him. He's got Galilean written all over him. Peter said, man, I don't know what you're talking about. At that very moment, the last word hardly off his lips, a rooster crowed. Just then, the master turned and looked at Peter. Peter remembered what the master had said to him. Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. He went out and cried and cried and cried. The men in charge of Jesus began poking fun at him, slapping him around. They put a blindfold on him and taunted, Who hit you that time? They were having a grand time with him. When it was morning, the religious leaders of the people and the high priest and scholars all got together and brought him before their high council. They said, Are you the Messiah? He answered, If I said yes, you wouldn't believe me. If I asked what you meant by your question, you wouldn't answer me. So here's what I have to say. From here on, the Son of Man takes his place at God's right hand, the place of power. They all said, so you admit your claim to be the Son of God. You're the ones who keep saying it, he said. But they had made up their minds. Why do we need any more evidence? We've all heard him as good as say it himself. Luke 23. Then they all took Jesus to Pilate and began to bring up charges against him. They said, We found this man undermining our law and order, forbidding taxes to be paid to Caesar, setting himself up as Messiah King. Pilate asked him, Is this true that you're King of the Jews? Those are your words, not mine, Jesus replied. Pilate told the high priest and the accompanying crowd, I find nothing wrong here. He seems harmless enough to me. But they were vehement. He's stirring up unrest among the people with his teaching, disturbing the peace everywhere, starting in Galilee and now all through Judea. He's a dangerous man, endangering the peace. When Pilate heard that, he asked, So he's a Galilean? Realizing that he properly came under Herod's jurisdiction, he passed the buck to Herod, who just happened to be in Jerusalem for a few days. Herod was delighted when Jesus showed up. He had wanted for a long time to see him. He'd heard so much about him. He hoped to see him do something spectacular. He peppered him with questions. Jesus didn't answer, not one word. But the high priest and religious scholars were right there, saying their piece, strident and shrill in their accusations. Mightily offended, Herod turned on Jesus. His soldiers joined in, taunting and jeering. Then they dressed him up in an elaborate king costume and sent him back to Pilate. That day, Herod and Pilate became thick as thieves, always before they had kept their distance. Then Pilate called in the high priest, rulers, and the others and said, You brought this man to me as a disturber of the peace. I examined him in front of all of you and found there was nothing to your charge. And neither did Herod, for he has sent him back here with a clean bill of health. 
It's clear that he's done nothing wrong, let alone anything deserving death. I'm going to warn him to watch his step and let him go. At that, the crowd went wild. Kill him. Give us Barabbas. Barabbas had been thrown in prison for starting a riot in the city and for murder. Pilate still wanted to let Jesus go and so spoke out again, but they kept shouting back, crucify, crucify him. He tried a third time, but for what crime? I found nothing in him deserving death. I'm going to warn him to watch his step and let him go. But they kept at it, a shouting mob, demanding that he be crucified. And finally, they shouted him down. Pilate caved in and gave them what they wanted. He released the man thrown in prison for rioting and murder and gave them Jesus to do whatever they wanted. As they led him off, they made Simon, a man from Cyrene who happened to be coming in from the countryside, carry the cross behind Jesus. A huge crowd of people followed, along with women weeping and carrying on. At one point, Jesus turned to the women and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, don't cry for me. Cry for yourselves and for your children. The time is coming when they'll say, Lucky the women who never conceived. Lucky the wombs that never gave birth. Lucky the breasts that never gave milk. Then they'll start calling to the mountains, fall down on us, calling to the hills, cover us up. If people do these things to a live green tree, can you imagine what they'll do with dead wood? Two others, both criminals, were taken along with him for execution. When they got to the place called Skull Hill, they crucified him, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Dividing up his clothes, they threw dice for them. The people stood there staring at Jesus, and the ringleaders made faces, taunting, He saved others. Let's see him save himself. The Messiah of God? Ha! <laughs> the Chosen? Ha! <laughs> the soldiers also came up and poked fun at him, making a game of it. They toasted him with sour wine. So you're king of the Jews. Save yourself. Printed over him was a sign. This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals hanging alongside cursed him. So Messiah you are, save yourself, save us. But the other one made him shut up. Have you no fear of God? You're getting the same as him. We deserve this, but not him. He did nothing to deserve this. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you enter your kingdom. He said, don't worry, I will. Today you will join me in paradise. By now it was noon. The whole earth became dark the darkness lasting three hours, a total blackout. The temple curtain split right down the middle. Jesus called loudly, Father, I place my life in your hands. Then he breathed his last. When the captain there saw what happened, he honored God. This man was innocent, a good man and innocent. All who had come around as spectators to watch the show, when they saw what actually happened, were overcome with grief and headed home. Those who knew Jesus well, along with the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a respectful distance and kept vigil. There was a man by the name of Joseph, a member of the Jewish High Council, a man of good heart and good character. He had not gone along with the plans and actions of the council. His hometown was the Jewish village of Arimathea. He lived in alert expectation of the kingdom of God. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Taking him down, he wrapped him in a linen shroud and placed him in a tomb chiseled into the rock, a tomb never yet used. It was the day before Sabbath, the Sabbath just about to begin. The women who had been companions of Jesus from Galilee followed along. They saw the tomb where Jesus' body was placed. Then they went back to prepare burial spices and perfumes. They rested quietly on the Sabbath as commanded. Luke 24 At the crack of dawn on Sunday, the women came to the tomb carrying the burial spices they had prepared. They found the entrance stone rolled back from the tomb, so they walked in. But once inside, they couldn't find the body of the master, Jesus. They were puzzled, wondering what to make of this. Then out of nowhere, it seemed, two men, light cascading over them, stood there. The women were awestruck and bowed down in worship. The men said, "'Why are you looking for the living one in a cemetery?' He is not here, but raised up. Remember how he told you when you were still back in Galilee that he had to be handed over to sinners, be killed on a cross, and in three days rise up. Then they remembered Jesus' words. They left the tomb and broke the news of all this to the eleven and the rest. 
Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them kept telling these things to the apostles, but the apostles didn't believe a word of it, thought they were making it all up. But Peter jumped to his feet and ran to the tomb. He stooped to look in and saw a few grave clothes, that's all. He walked away puzzled, shaking his head. That same day, two of them were walking to the village Emmaus, about seven miles out of Jerusalem. They were deep in conversation, going over all these things that had happened. In the middle of their talk and questions, Jesus came up and walked along with them, but they were not able to recognize who he was. He asked, What's this you're discussing so intently as you walk along? They just stood there, long-faced, like they had lost their best friend. Then one of them, his name was Cleopas, said, Are you the only one in Jerusalem who hasn't heard what's happened during the last few days? He said, What has happened? They said, The things that happened to Jesus the Nazarene. He was a man of God, a prophet, dynamic in work and word, blessed by both God and all the people. Then our high priests and leaders betrayed him, got him sentenced to death, and crucified him. And we had our hopes up that he was the one, the one about to deliver Israel. And it is now the third day since it happened. But now some of our women have completely confused us. Early this morning, they were at the tomb and couldn't find his body. They came back with the story that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of our friends went off to the tomb to check and found it empty just as the women said, but they didn't see Jesus. Then he said to them, So thick-headed, so slow-hearted, why can't you simply believe all that the prophet said? Don't you see that these things had to happen, that the Messiah had to suffer and only then enter into his glory? Then he started at the beginning with the books of Moses and went on through all the prophets, pointing out everything in the scriptures that referred to him. They came to the edge of the village where they were headed. He acted as if he were going on, but they pressed him. Stay and have supper with us. It's nearly evening. The day is done. So he went in with them. And here is what happened. He sat down at the table with them, taking the bread. He blessed and broke and gave it to them. At that moment, open-eyed, wide-eyed, they recognized him. And then he disappeared. Back and forth, they talked. Didn't we feel on fire as he conversed with us on the road, as he opened up the scriptures for us? They didn't waste a minute. They were up and on their way back to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and their friends gathered together, talking away. It's really happened. The master has been raised up. Simon saw him. Then the two went over everything that happened on the road and how they recognized him when he broke the bread. While they were saying all this, Jesus appeared to them and said, Peace be with you. They thought they were seeing a ghost and were scared half to death. He continued with them, Don't be upset and don't let all these doubting questions take over. Look at my hands. Look at my feet. It's really me. Touch me, look me over from head to toe. A ghost doesn't have muscle and bone like this. As he said this, he showed them his hands and feet. They still couldn't believe what they were seeing. It was too much. It seemed too good to be true. He asked, do you have any food here? They gave him a piece of leftover fish they had cooked. He took it and ate it right before their eyes. Then he said, everything I told you while I was with you comes to this. All the things written about me in the Law of Moses, in the Prophets, and in the Psalms have to be fulfilled. He went on to open their understanding of the Word of God, showing them how to read their Bibles this way. He said, You can see now how it is written that the Messiah suffers, rises from the dead on the third day, and then a total life change through the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed in His name to all nations, starting from here, from Jerusalem. You're the first to hear and see it. You're the witnesses. What comes next is very important. I am sending what my father promised to you. So stay here in the city until he arrives, until you're equipped with power from on high. He then led them out of the city over to Bethany. Raising his hands, he blessed them, and while blessing them, made his exit, being carried up to heaven. And they were on their knees worshiping him. They returned to Jerusalem, bursting with joy. They spent all their time in the temple praising God. Yes. That is Luke chapters 22 through 24. Let's pray together. Jesus, I thank you for this story. And I thank you for the story and the message. I love their pieces that I heard today and will think about for a long time that I don't know I've ever picked up before. So I thank you that we are privileged enough to have the Bible in English in multiple different forms. 
And it just has me thinking that today there are so many people around the world that don't have a Bible. They don't have one in their language. They don't have one in their home. And um, so God, make a way. Make a way for people to know the scripture like we're getting to hear it today. Yeah, we are really grateful. We are really grateful to get to read the Bible and to hear the story of your death and resurrection, Jesus. And we will celebrate that tomorrow. We will celebrate that on Easter. We are we are really grateful. We are grateful that we have a God that is not dead, but living. We have a God that is living. We love you, Jesus. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.